We've talked about what makes an uncompressed two-dimensional image in memory, and now we're going to try and take that a step further to three dimensions, or indeed more dimensions if that's your thing. For a computer scientist, the difference between two-dimensional data and three-dimensional data is really neither here nor there. We just have more data on the end that we use to represent our, set, our next dimension. Um, in an image, it's much the same thing. So where we had our header before, and we have pixel one, and then pixel two, depending on the size of our image, these pixels will go through the rows of our first image, and then we'll start straight on with the rows of our next image. Okay? So if our image is, let's say, two by two by two, like this, and we sometimes refer to these as voxels, volumetric pixels. So this will be pixel one here in this box. Uh, this will be pixel two, three, and four. So after our padding, we might have pixel three here and pixel four here. And then we crack straight on with pixel five, six, seven, but behind this cube, and eight down here. So we literally go straight into five, six, seven, eight. And it's just a huge one-dimensional array, just like with our two-dimensional data. And the formula for calculating our position is just an extension of the formula we talked about last time. Uh, so we now have a z index. This is our x, this is our y, and this is our z, going back like this. This is our stride, the number of bytes per row. This is the number of bytes per image, and then our total file. So now, if we call this, let's say, depth, Okay, then we can say that our pixel, P, anywhere in our three-dimensional structure is equal to Z times by the depth plus Y times by the stride plus X. And what we're essentially doing here is with our Z, we jump to the specific image in our depth, then we jump to a specific row, and then we jump to the specific pixel that we want. And then, just like with normal images, that pixel may contain a red, a green, a blue, maybe an alpha, or it could be grayscale. The interesting thing about 3D images for me is that the uh, depth dimension could actually be something other than depth. So in a video, it's time. Each frame is essentially moving forward, and our depth is essentially each frame, one after another, in a big stack. You could use the word voxel to represent a three-dimensional pixel if you like. I don't tend to unless it represents some kind of actual volume. In the video Professor Primmel did in the 3D CT data, we have a two-dimensional set of image slices through a volume and together they make a three-dimensional volume. And once we've segmented out the root portions, we have voxels that are essentially root and voxels that, that are not root and we can distinguish between the two. People will be familiar with voxel-based games like Minecraft or lots of other ones and they work in much the same way. In Minecraft you have space, which takes up voxels, or you have matter, which could be soil or something else, and it's still represented as a big volume. So for each X, Y, Z location, the, the map, the level data file will hold whether there is soil at that location or empty space or something else. So I've got a few examples um, that we can look at to, uh, to see, so if I get my laptop here. So I've loaded um, three different types of three-dimensional image data using a software package. Just to demonstrate really that at a low level, once they're uncompressed and we're not considering any kind of file format problems, they're really very similar. So this particular image I'm looking at now is a three-dimensional slice of a root section. So this is taken using a confocal laser scanning microscope. A what? <laughs> a confocal laser microscope. And what that does is bounce lasers into the root and when they come out, it captures that colour and works out what's going on inside the tissue. And the nice thing about a laser microscope is you can actually capture slices through a root deep into the tissue without actually having to cut it up. Um, a bit like in the same way that the X-ray CT works with X-rays. So in this case, we've got an X, Y, Z three-dimensional image where Z is our, is our depth through the root. So if I move this slider here, this is our X and Y, and then this slider down here is our Z, and we're stepping through the root and moving downwards, and you can see that the root gets thinner as we approach the end, and then fatter again and you can see all the nuclei and the cell walls. To give you an idea of the scale of this image, this root is about 120 microns wide. This is actually thinner than a human hair. You can barely see them yourself, which is why we're on this really powerful microscope. So this is our um, image where our Z uh, dimension is actually representing depth. This is a different type of image uh, taken using a hyperspectral camera. So a hyperspectral camera, instead of measuring simply R, G and B, it measures a lot more than that. In fact, a thousand different wavelengths for this particular camera. And this is all the way from 400 nanometers, which is sort of deep blue, all the way up into the infrared at a thousand nanometers. In this instance, the Z dimension that we're looking at is wavelength. At this case, showing us 400 nanometers. So as we go through here, we'll see the different colors and how the plant reflects different patterns of light. So if we increase the wavelength now, we can see that the plant doesn't reflect much blue. 
uh, but the flower does, which is why we can see the flowers nice and brightly. And then as we go further on, we can see that the plant suddenly starts reflecting and that's where we're now at the green. Most plants appear green because they absorb blue and red for use in photosynthesis and they reflect green. So if we continue going up through the wavelengths, as we get to the red, we'll see a big drop off in the amount of reflectance and that's because all that light's been absorbed. But you can see again that the flowers are extremely bright and that is essentially sort of a target for insects doing their foraging. Are there any fruit on this? Because it's a strawberry, isn't it? Uh, this is a strawberry plant, yes. No, there's no fruit on this. It's too young, unfortunately, and we don't get to eat them. Um, also, if you'd seen a lab, you probably wouldn't want to uh, eat the fruit. What we're looking at is how the health of the plant uh, affects the kind of light wavelengths that it reflects. Um, so as we go up into the infrared, you can see the plant becomes extremely bright, and that's because it's reflecting a lot of infrared light. So this image, in memory, is very much like our depth stack, except that now we're representing our, our z-dimension as something else, in this case, wavelength. Finally, this is just a simple video of some horses running on a beach. That's very pleasant. And in this case, our Z dimension is simply time, or number of frames. So if we go through, we can see we can go out, back and forth. And it works in exactly the same way as the other image data. This is all in a huge chunk of memory. And when it needs to render a certain image, it will jump to that position and read off those rows. What we've seen is that uh, three-dimensional images held in memory once they're uncompressed and we're not concerning ourselves with what format they're in are very much like two-dimensional images. There's literally just more data on the end. So instead of jumping just by rows and by pixels, we can also jump by image in the stack. And we can go further back. Um, and then we can use that to hold videos or depth stacks, 3D data, like in the case of our roots, or um, hyperspectral data. Uh, and so we can redo really anything we want with, um, with this, with this three-dimensional data. And if you wanted to take it further, we could have, let's say, um, a series of hyperspectral images taken over time and then you've got four-dimensional image data and then the operations just become increasingly long. We've got a lot of investment in 8-bit code. How can we exploit that investment whilst getting into the 16-bit market? And, and, and so what we had sketched on the table was that it was effectively a dual processor system. 